A couple of weeks ago, I was in London. I caught up with Petar Vlichkovic from DeepMind. Uh, he and his colleagues have just released a new paper called Tactic AI, an AI assistant for football tactics. So today we're going to hear from the man himself. He's going to talk all about the paper. And also there's a couple of things at the end which I think you'll find surprising. Petter said that identifying key patterns of tactics implemented by rival teams and developing effective responses lies at the heart of modern football. However, doing so algorithmically is still wide open in terms of research. Now, this algorithm, Tactic AI, is what Petter developed at DeepMind, working closely with Liverpool Football Club. Tactic AI incorporates both a predictive and generative component, allowing the coaches to effectively sample and explore alternative player setups for each corner kick and to select those with the highest predicted likelihood of success. The model suggestions are not only indistinguishable from real tactics, but also favoured over existing tactics 90% of the time. Corner kick situations are represented as graphs, with players as nodes and their relationships as edges, and this allows modelling the interactions between players, which may be more important than absolute distances. Now, of course, this is using geometric deep learning. Petr Velichkovich, of course, is famous for the geometric deep learning blueprint. You need to go and watch that episode. It was a special edition. But, you know, the, the core of the episode is why don't we um, kind of prototype the way all deep learning inductive priors are instrumented, you know, which is to say um, deep learning models typically work on the basis of symmetry and scale separation. So symmetry might be something like a CNN, which um, introduces translational um, equivariance, you know, so with local weight sharing. And um, the scale separation is uh, represented as a max pooling in, in a CNN. So neural networks in their different guises do this scale separation and symmetry. So go and check out that episode on, on GDL. But needless to say, this is an implementation of GDL using graph attention networks, which represent symmetries in the game. So the kind of symmetries I'm talking about are invariance to horizontal or vertical reflections. Now doing this is really, really good because it massively improves the sample efficiency and robustness of these neural networks. Because what we're basically doing is we're saying, rather than try and learn all of the things, because many of those things aren't even likely to occur in this particular situation. We're constraining the neural network. By the way, we did a really good conversation with um, Dr. Daniel Roberts at MIT about this, which is on the Patreon, so go and check that out. Uh, but it will be released here pretty soon. So this particular model uses a graph attention network, which, by the way, is another thing that Petter invented while he was at DeepMind. But um, graph networks are really, really good for capturing... Um, a permutation symmetry invariance, right? So in this particular case, we are learning relationships between players in the game, and we project those into a high dimensional, um, you know, vector space. And the network is, is constrained in such a way that it is invariant to different permutations of those relationships. So this inductive prior is perfect for this use case. Anyway, I really hope you enjoy this conversation today. Here is Petr Velichkovich. So yeah, I have recently been involved in a project using graph machine learning and geometric deep learning, which as we will see today is actually just a special case of categorical deep learning, uh, to study tactics in football, which was uh, a project that uh, we have done together with uh, Liverpool Football Club. Uh, it's part of a long-standing collaboration, which lasted uh, several years, since 2019. And uh, we've done a lot of like individual milestones and prototypes along the way where we demonstrated that there are some specific tasks of interest to a football club that you are capable of learning with a machine learning model. However, none of those things were necessarily verifiably capable of actually dishing out suggestions to coaches and analysts that uh, we would actually be confident they would find useful. And Tactic AI is actually the first milestone in which we actually believe we have an AI uh, football tactics assistant on our hands because Tactic AI is capable not only to predict what will happen in certain football situations, but it's also capable of uh, giving you representations that support very good retrieval. Uh, a video analyst, for example, needs to rewatch many situations that are similar to a given one in preparation for a particular game. Uh, and also we have a generative model, which is capable of uh, forecasting not only what will happen in a particular situation, but like 
how do I need to reposition my players or their velocities such that a certain outcome is more or less likely? And this is something that coaches can take a look at. And at least in our direct studies with them, they found that these tactical suggestions were definitely plausible in the sense that they couldn't distinguish them from actual situations that happened in the Premier League. But also they were quite favorable in that 90% of the time, the experts preferred the situation suggested by Tactic AI to what actually happened in the Premier League. So we definitely now know that these suggestions are salient. And how do we know that they are useful? We know they're useful because we focused on corner kicks specifically. And uh, as you might know, you can build these models to... Uh, predict stuff about open play as well, and that's actually how we started. But actually, even if you get a model giving you a suggestion about the current state of open play, you know, a coach cannot always meaningfully act on it in the moment. And in fact, if you shout at your players while they're in the middle of open play, that might actually confuse them and not give you the outcome you want. So corner kicks are really great because it's a moment when the game is effectively frozen. Uh, it always uh, starts from the same kind of position in the corner of the pitch. And it gives you an immediate opportunity for goal scoring, which happens relatively frequently in a game about uh, 10 times on average, right? And they're so important and recognized as, uh, as an important part of decision making that usually the strategies for corners are decided well ahead of any particular game so that there's no confusion on the day between how the team executes on these things. So we have practical suggestions and they've been specifically validated in the context of corner kicks with experts from Liverpool. So we actually now do believe that we have a uh, tactical assistant for football which can actually be deployed downstream. Of course, there hasn't been any actual deployment yet. It's very recent, fresh off the press research, but we are hopeful that these results are convincing enough that in the future, relatively near future, we'll see Tactic AI or variants of Tactic AI helping speed up the job of coaches on the pitch. Quick question about reasoning. So um, you said that this thing discovers motifs that generalize really well and produce behaviors that even experts say look like good behaviors. But um, with reasoning, you can kind of start with statistical generalizing motifs in the perceptual domain, and then you can take that all the way across the spectrum to system two reasoning, where we actually have a model of the world and, and we have you know goals and intentions and we have a higher more you know high level more abstract form of reasoning where on that spectrum is this right so i would say it is more closer to system one mainly because like we could build a more accurate model that's that you can then roll out to like predict things way ahead in the future but I would say, first of all, in a corner, that's not that important because you usually need to forecast something that will happen maybe 10 seconds in the future. So it's not that far off and local decisions will be sufficient to like reason about roughly what's likely to happen. And uh, as for longer term ones, I'm sure it would be super exciting to build a model that is capable of forecasting plausible futures that far ahead. But the problem is the game of football has so many unobservables, so many latent things. And, you know, sometimes a human might just in the moment decide to do something different to confuse the opposing team that you never forecasted in your model. That like, even when we did show to the football experts some rollouts from an open play model, they thought, yeah, these look cool, these look plausible, but, you know, the actual chances of this particular sequence unfolding is actually near zero when you go far away enough from your starting position. So here, system two is interesting, but likely less uh, likely to be less practical, I guess. So that's why we haven't pursued it as much. Okay, and, and on that, I, I love this idea of thinking of intelligence as this kind of collective divergent search process. So as you were just alluding to, you have many different players and in the moment they're making split decisions and they're just navigating this sea of entropy. And to a certain extent, we can find pockets of regularity and we can kind of predict it into that sea. But I mean, it, what, what do you think is, is the future here? Hmm. So what I actually think is, well, the near future is definitely going to be centered on set pieces. So this is like corners are one example. They're the easiest one to influence because they're, well, technically penalties are even easier to influence. They're just rare. And actually our first paper with Liverpool analyzed only penalties. That was like the easiest place to start. It's a very well-defined rigid problem and you can model like the distribution of where the penalty will be taken, where different goalkeepers prefer to uh, defend it and so on. Corner kicks are the next step. You can imagine this going then into free kicks, going into throw-ins, things like that, which are also potentially dangerous, but you cannot control where they happen, right? So it gives you a more broader spectrum of initial conditions to like model from. 
I still think like full open play could be interesting, but only in a more distributional sense, if that makes sense. So rather than trying to make sense of exactly what's going to happen, you can try to model maybe a lot among like higher order patterns, what are the likely futures from a particular position, and then maybe drive some substitutions or things like that, which you can do to influence the action uh, in the moment. But that's kind of that's kind of as far as it can go with football. There are obviously many other sports, which are team sports, where you can model relationships between players that uh, uh, you know are amenable to exactly the same approach. Our approach uses a graph neural network with like a simple geometric deep learning approach to model the symmetries of the pitch. So there's nothing really football specific baked into that architecture. You can use it for basketball, for American football, basically anything anything that makes sense. In fact, I would also I often like to relate what we did in some sense to Moneyball, which is obviously the the famed strategy that uh, made a baseball team really successful, even though they didn't have a lot of resources by using pure statistics. But why did this work so well in baseball? Well, in baseball, every single action is a set, is a set piece, right? The game is frozen every single play that you're playing, and therefore, in that scenario, you can kind of have decision making on a much more granular uh, way and more effectively than you can do in football on a, in open play, right? And final question on this, why is it that graph neural networks are better for this use case? All right. Uh, so basically, this is a problem. I, I always like to say graph machine learning is the best choice, or well, geometric deep learning more generally, or as we'll see today, categorical deep learning. If uh, you, the problem you're trying to model is in some sense natural and involves complex interactions. So the places where you tend to see Graph machine learning nowadays appear a lot in like big profile publications are, you know, forecasting the weather. You have models like GraphCast, which are based on GNNs. Uh, predicting uh, new material structures like the GNOME model, also from DeepMind, which forecasted structures of various materials. Um, now, uh, still very much so in drug discovery. So there was that earlier work that used GNNs from MIT to discover new possible antibiotics. This line of work is still alive and well. And recently, a new very important uh, antibiotic for a very rare condition has been discovered. So that's another, uh, that's another uh, great publication that happened last year. So football, you know, you might not immediately relate it to these different scientific problems, but it is a complex natural problem that depends a lot on relationships relationships between players, both like the synergies they develop when they trained with each other, but also certain combinations of uh, antagonistic synergies between opposing players. So for example, a particular player might be really good at marking another player because they kind of know the quirks of each other and things like that. So really, but it doesn't just stop at binary relations. I think often strategies involve tandems of like triplets or even four players at once, right? So I would say... The fact that structure plays such a big part in the distributional success, I'm not saying the exact success of any particular situation is always a bit up to chance because you cannot control for the wind, you cannot control for how the ball is kicked always and things like that. But on average, like in distribution across an entire season, these patterns pretty much hold and GNNs are the right kind of tool to reason explicitly, like you force the model to think explicitly about those pairwise relations and actually take them into account when you're making predictions. Okay, and just to play that back the way I understand it, um, there's a kind of information diffuse, uh, diffusal in, in the system and graph neural networks model that in a principled way, still with a fixed amount of computation per iteration, but it can do this message passing, it can do this information dif diffusal and that is particularly well suited for a certain class of problems. Yes, I would say so. In the, in the concrete case of football, uh, we are dealing with corner kick situations where the input is exactly the snapshot of the situation right at the moment the ball is about to be kicked. So it's a static graph on which indeed you will do a fixed number of message passing steps. I forgot exactly, I think we do four layers or something like that. So yes, it's a fixed computational budget, but as I said, you only really need short-term predictions for this one, so that's fine. But in general, if you want to model open play, you'll typically have a temporal sequence of uh, frames that you can work from. And then for that, you can usually imagine, depending on the granularity of your steps, uh, running this message passing for many, many steps, and basically the number of steps will grow with the number of frames you have, and you can even have recurrence, uh, like sharing the layers across different steps and so on. So it, it has the potential to go on for as long as you want it to. I certainly do this a lot in my algorithmic reasoning work, like when you model steps of an algorithm, you typically cannot have a fixed budget because the budget will increase as your input size increases usually. Um, but yeah, for this particular application, it is a fixed amount of 
computation just because it doesn't have to be particularly large. Okay, and, and final really quick question. How do you think having systems like this reflexively used by humans will affect our own understanding and thinking about the sport? All right. So I would say that uh, it's, it's not as immediate or like impactful as we think. It's more subtle, but it could have a big impact. So specifically, the way in which our generative system works is it's actually a variational autoencoder. So it's not trained to produce tactical suggestions. It's actually trained to reconstruct initial tactics conditioned on the shot event happening or not happening. So what then happens at test time, right, is you feed it a new situation and you set the shot flag either to zero or one, depending on do you want to modify player positions to increase or decrease the shot probability, right? But the system was never actually judged on how well it performs on those like uh, unseen combinations of situation and shot flag, right? So it's a new setting for it, but because it's trained to minimize basically mean squared error, uh, it is going to produce outputs that are similar, close to the input situation. So, as uh, like this is me basically quoting some of the words that the human experts who analyze these outputs told us, because it's such a subtle adjustment, these things are not directly going to suggest us new tactics, right? They're really suggesting refinements of existing ones. But that being said, just think about the job of a particular coach in a football club. They probably have to analyze lots of these situations that actually happened in a game to track what happened across 22 players and then make sense of, oh, this player might have been critical to that success or this player fell asleep on the wheel and that's why it failed. So it's like, you know, like it's really hard. It's not easy to discover these things by the naked eye. And now you have a system like this that can propose using the VAE as many suggestions as you want within seconds, right? And now suddenly you don't have to like f focus so much to discover certain patterns, they'll be displayed to you immediately because you'll see the corrections, right? And then maybe those corrections are not perfect. In most cases they're not, right? But they sometimes immediately indicate to the coach that yeah, actually this player is trying to block but they're moving way too slowly to block. It makes a lot more sense for them to track at that particular point given how fast the attacker is moving. Then just to give one example, right? So this immediately gives them a sort of idea for what kind of training we might want to give our players if they were asleep on the wheel in a particular situation or if an opposing player tends to be asleep on the wheel, design our tactics to exploit uh, something around that player, right? So um, I would say it will free up coaches to do less of the staring at situations and more the actual creative, actionable decision-making part of it because tactic AI just gives you, you know, a picture of a possible situation, but it's up to you what you're going to do about it, right? And that's actually the part that matters when you go in a game. It's not what Tactic AI produced. So I think with coaches having more time to focus on that part of the work, we are going to see more creative play happening. And we've definitely seen that there is a drift in strategy concepts because if, uh, depending on how we choose our test set, like if we test our model on randomly sampled corners versus corners only that happened in the last season versus previous seasons used for training, the performance of the model slightly drops when you test only on the latest season. So there is a bit of concept drift. There are new tactics being tried out and prototyped and the game gets more creative over time. But now, if coaches have a bit more free time on their hands, the creativity might accelerate. Yeah, I mean, that's it's something I think about a lot. It's a similar thing with warfare, for example. So, you know, we, we, have a, we have an increase in capabilities and then the enemy has a commensurate adaptation. And it's a similar thing with language models, for example. They are very creative at the beginning. They help us understand and crystallize many categories and like bits of knowledge that perhaps we couldn't articulate and express before. And then, you know, we start to incorporate those things. And then there's an adaptation from, from the adversary and, there's, and there, then there's a drift. So it's almost, it's a little bit like a credit card, I suppose, that it, it's really valuable now, but you have to keep training it and and um, making it learn continuously to, to take into account the adaptation. Luckily, in this case, it's a super lightweight model. You can train it on a CPU in mere hours, and clubs only play a game every couple of days. So in this case, you can keep retraining it. It's not a big deal. Beautiful. For Petra. language models, not so easy. <laughs> yeah. Petra, this was amazing. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Yeah.